And yet, yes, she seems to transmit something. I talked to the actor Eli Wallach, who knew Marilyn well from the actor's studio days in New York in the mid-50s. He told me a story of walking down a Manhattan street with Marilyn. She was dressed in baggy pants and a baggy top and a scarf around her head and no makeup. And nobody was looking, to his relief. And then suddenly, everyone was looking. And he looked around to see, you know, was Marilyn wiggling? And uh, she wasn't wiggling. And he said, but, you know, what have you done? And she said, I don't know. I guess I just started being Marilyn. And uh, Robert Kennedy's secretary, Angie Novello, who, as a woman, I think a woman's opinion of Marilyn is fascinating, uh, expected to dislike Marilyn. And then in the company of Robert Kennedy, she met Marilyn at Peter Lawford's house in California and felt this intuitive intelligence and sense of humor, but also just something. And she said, I could understand why any man would fall off his perch and leave his wife and run away and for Marilyn. It was something she did. It's something that came through the celluloid when her directors thought they had nothing on film. And maybe she's now transmitting through the, through the posters. Of course, you are also paraphrasing some of the comments that Jeannie Martin, Dean Martin's former wife, made to about the poster people. Yes. And how absolutely. there was a world of these people who were in a social situation she told you in the book. Yeah, they would walk into a room and as total strangers be drawn toward each yeah. other. I agree with her on that. What I disagree with um, is her notion that Marilyn is just a poster person. Uh, Marilyn is much more and perhaps, although there are some who've been upset by my book because it shows Marilyn, Marilyn rather than the, the poster or the screen Marilyn, um, the sadness as well as the, the swagger and the tits and bum, um, and the little girl voice, which wasn't her voice all the time. Um, I think maybe that she'll become almost more interesting, perhaps more, she'll endear herself perhaps more by showing her as she was. All right, on that we will take another commercial break and come back with more with Anthony Summers and Goddess, The Secret Lives of Marilyn Monroe, right after this. Talking about your investigator, I must say, 600 interview subjects, almost three years of your life. And in reading the book and finding out about you, I just wonder if there's a moment, you've already said you were not a fan of Marilyn Monroe in the movies at a time when you might have been. But one thinks of the Preminger film, Laura, and Dana Andrews looking at a portrait of Jean Tierney and falling in love while investigating. Did you find yourself infatuated? Were you like Norman Mailer, thinking, if only I'd met her? I wonder if Norman Mailer, I, I know him fairly well. I, I doubt Norman was ever infatuated with the idea of Marilyn. He was fascinated, and she became, I think, uh, a toy on his typewriter. Um, no, I didn't become. It was too tough a road to fall in love with her. I became very interested in her. I liked her more for the best things about her, for the sense of humor. You know, she made people, it wasn't just in, in the movies, Billy Wilder um, has, has said of her that he looks around, she's such a good comedian, that he looks around still to this day, he reads a, a screenplay and, and he thinks, right, that's Marilyn, and then he, whoops, he does a double take, she's gone, she's not there, he finds her irreplaceable. But in real life, she made people laugh. She was fun to be with, except when she was in her worst psychotic spells, as she was so often near the end. And I think, although, as you know, I, I, my research indicates that Marilyn was far more psychiatrically sick than anybody understood, nevertheless, there's, you like a person who makes people laugh, and it's a sign of sanity if you have a sense of humor. She could laugh at herself for most of her adult life, and that's important. Wasn't it, was it Dr. Greenson in the book who said that if her name had not been Marilyn Monroe, she would have been committed? Yeah, he said that in the last months, uh, he would have committed her to an institution had she not been Marilyn Monroe. And I think that that was uh, because he felt that this would have destroyed her, that she, because she was her, she would have perhaps 
tried to commit suicide if she had been put in, a, in another institution. She was put in an institution a year or so before she died. And um, she came out, made a joke about it, and said, well, of course, I was the only, you know, everybody else but me in there was crazy. And she was talking about the doctors. And then, of course, there is that astonishing and touching image of her mother leaving the home in which she had lived all of those years and finally being found. Was it in the Baptist church? Yes, this, this was a year, uh, I thought it was a Christian science church. Um, Marilyn's mother's um, area of zeal, religious zeal, and that seems to have been the focus of her problems, uh, was Christian science. And she escaped a year after Marilyn had died and um, climbed down a rope of knotted sheets literally, as in schoolboy stories, and, and ran away and walked through suburban Los Angeles and was found indeed in a church and taken back to the institution. Uh, she but was she, never dangerous, she was never dangerously ill, the mother, I don't think. But she knew Marilyn was gone. She, she knew Marilyn, Marilyn was gone. gone. She said, yes, um, Marilyn, and interesting, she called her Marilyn, which was of course only the stage name, never Norma Jean, and she said, I always told her. Um, I didn't, you know, it wasn't right for her to be an actress. She's alive still, the mother. The mother is to be found in Florida. She managed in the end to do a flip to Florida and escape the California law and escape institutions. She now lives in a little one-room apartment, unknown to most people, rides a red tricycle and goes around the streets of the little Florida town handing out Christian science leaflets. She's no harm to anyone. Did you learn something when you were writing your book, Conspiracy, the assassination of John F. Kennedy? Was there a moment when you learned something about Marilyn Monroe and when the Sunday Express and Mr. Hall commissioned you to do what I assume at the time was to be a short, snappy piece? Mm -hmm. But it all came together and you thought, obviously I meant to put the no, next what, few years of my life into this? No, what dro drove me to do it was, you're right, of course, there was a brief reference to Marilyn of whom I knew nothing, um, a side reference in conspiracy. What happened to me was that I was sent to, to California to do uh, a look into the fact that the district attorney in Los Angeles was probing Marilyn's death. And on the way, I went to the library. I went to the library in Ireland, in Dungarvan, near my home by the river there. And I looked for the biography of Marilyn, which I assumed had long ago been written. And it wasn't there. There was Norman Mailer's book and there was a book written before she died and the book wasn't there. So I, I wanted a biography. My publishers wanted more investigative work. Will you stay and continue speaking about that? All right. To be continued. Thank you. While tearing off a game of golf, I may make a play for the caddy. But when I do, I don't follow through Cause my heart belongs to daddy If I invite a boy some night To dine on my fine food and hattie I just... Summer's here, it's time for the new Toronto Tees. Great new styles, bold new colors. Get you a Toronto Tees exclusively at Stitches and make this the hottest summer ever. Belongs to Daddy. So I simply couldn't be bad. Yes, my heart belongs to Daddy. Dad, 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 dad. So I want to walk. The Secret Lives of Marilyn Monroe produces dramatic new information on Marilyn Monroe's death, showing that evidence was destroyed, facts suppressed. It tells us at last what really happened on the night she died. And we'll be right back with author Anthony Summers and Goddess, The Secret Lives of Marilyn Monroe. Holding Goddess, The Secret Lives of Marilyn Monroe. As I mentioned, 
early upon meeting you, you know, the headlines had followed you. Mr. Hunter, is it Ron Hunter, the ambulance driver? Hunter, yes. Mr. Hunter. Ken Hunter. Ken Hunter, who now maintains that an ambulance was called. The oh, I know. Hunter was the, was the driver. Can I t tell oh, the ambulance please, story? Please, yes. It was extraordinary. Um, in working on the Munro project, I, obviously there comes a time when you have to stop. And I always have a file of must-dos, a file of probably do's and a file of maybe drops. And there were two particular things that I, I got to on the day that I promised myself that it was over, I was going back to Ireland the next day. They were the last calls. And I had been trying to track down what had only come to me as a sideways rumor, that perhaps an ambulance had been involved on the night that Marilyn died. And that there was no sign of this in any of the press reports, and I obviously read every tiniest and largest one of the period. N nothing about ambulance drivers. Well, and uh, finally I tracked down Mr. Schaefer, Walt Schaefer of Schaefer Ambulance, the boss and founder of the biggest private ambulance company in California. And on that last day of mine, he told me uh, that one of his ambulances had been called to Marilyn's home on the night that she died and had taken her away alive but in a coma to Santa Monica Hospital. Well, I stayed on another 24 hours and made more phone calls. And uh, in the end, I spoke to the two drivers that Schaefer named as being the men crewing the ambulance that night. One of them, uh, Hunter, was evasive. He, he told a different story, a slightly different story to me in, in, in crucial detail than he told to the district attorney's investigators a year or so earlier. And the other driver, a man called Lee, literally 